Well, watch the news. Uh, any, not even tonight, but any, any time, you can tell that the world's gone kind of, kind of crazy. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said uh, a number of years ago, if the other planets are inhabited, then they're using the earth for an insane asylum. <laughs> Which I thought was a, a, great, a great line. That could be some evidence that there's life on other, other planets, is, uh, the be- behavior here. But of course, we know that all of that craziness began back in Genesis. And of course, God creates, and Adam and Eve turn their back on God, rebel against him, sin enters the world, and death through it. Uh, God preserves the promise to Eve in Genesis 3.15 through Noah and his family. They come off the ark, and that promise continues, and it will go to or be in the line of the Messiah of Shem, uh, whose name literally means the name. And, of course, the people of God are known by those that follow the the name of God. Uh, Then we see Moses is very careful to trace that genealogy then to Abram that we're more familiar with. The name God gives him, Abraham. His name is mentioned 74 times in the New Testament. The only person that's said to be a friend of God. And because of this chapter, because of Abraham, uh, we have the nation of Israel, we have the Bible, and we have our Savior, Jesus Christ. The fact that we're going to heaven, the fact that uh, uh, we, uh, we know the Lord, is because of the call and the covenant of Abraham that we'll look at this morning. So it becomes very, very critical uh, for our understanding of even our, our own faith, even though it goes all the way back to prior to Moses, prior to the law, prior to those covenants. Uh, when Paul wants to explain our faith, he talks about Abraham uh, in Romans. When he wants to talk about uh, our faith again, in defending that we're saved by grace alone, uh, he against the Judaizers and writing the church at Galatia, he goes back to Abraham. When James is trying to explain that as Christians, uh, we are to have good works because we've been saved, he goes back to, uh, to Abraham. So uh, very important. Well, let's look at the call of Abraham, verse 1. There it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And uh, as we saw last week, he left Ur the Chaldeans. And uh, I uh, was tempted, but... Uh, You'd be proud of me. I didn't do it. I was going to show you all the slides of all the artifacts that were uncovered from her and the Chaldeans. But I'll tell you where you can get them. In fact, I gave you the website in your, your notes. The Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago houses the biggest collection of artifacts from Ur the Chaldeans. Again, the city that Abraham left. And uh, that uh, city goes back 20, 2500 B.C. And um, it's, uh, it's known as the treasure of the royal tomb of Ur. Uh, excavated by Sin, uh, Sir Leonard Woolley, 1922 to 1934. And uh, it's fascinating to look at because you'll again get this idea of um, the sophistication of the city, a city laid out with right angles, a city with, uh, with the, where they excavated, found schools, where advanced mathematics were, uh, were taught, uh, where there was a lot of trade and commerce. Uh, there was huge housing tracts that they found. It was just a very highly developed uh, 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 center of commerce as well as education and so forth. And of course, the center of it being the ziggurat that I did show you uh, last week and the top of that being the chamber in which they would have done human sacrifices in worship to uh, the moon god. And of course, they had others and their pantheons of gods as well. And so the image of Abraham as being this guy that lived in a tent, had a few sheep, and you know life wasn't too good, and God says, well, come on, I'll give you a better life, is, is not the image. Uh, Abraham had a very uh, good life that was there, well entrenched in society, had his own kinky little family going, remember? I mean, he marries his sister, his brother marries his niece. I mean, whatever else is going on in the family, we don't know. But, but it's all to say is that he wasn't like somebody really special. You know, it's like everybody's living there, and there's this one really righteous guy, is Abraham. So God says to him, no, Abraham is a, we know from Scripture, an idol worshiper. He's just right in there with everybody else. Nothing special about him uh, at all. It's by God's grace that God calls him. And that's important for us to understand. It's the same way that he calls each of us. Uh, In terms of what he does, one translator likens the call to this. uh, Quote, I command you to go forth with closed eyes. 
and forbid you to inquire where I, I am about to lead you until having renounced your country, you shall give yourself wholly to me. In other words, it still took, I think, a lot of faith for Abraham to walk away from everything that he had there. 52-inch flat screen TV, BMW. I mean, he had a nice place there. And uh, <clears throat> one, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Agatha Christie uh, novels or anything, but uh, she actually visited the site while it was under excavation, falls in love and marries one of Wooly's uh, assistants. And she has some very interesting things to say about Wooly himself, that uh, he, he could look at the archaeological site and describe to you exactly what was going on in the city at any moment during, during the day and what Abraham's life would have, uh, would have been like. And apparently, it was quite the guy who could have done that in, the, in, a, in a very fashionable way. But uh, a very different image that we need to realize that what God calls Abraham uh, out of. But he calls him out of idolatry. We saw that from Joshua 24. There, again, the city given over to the worship of the moon God. Now, John 15, 16, Jesus says to us, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And uh, in the same, same way that he says, leave all of this behind and come and follow me, Jesus says the same to us. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 10, 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Mark 8, 35, Jesus says, for whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Jesus calls us again in a very similar way to, the God, to God calling Abraham. But what we want to look at here and kind of focus on is this, I, I think sometimes a misconception about our own walk with the Lord. God calls him, it was a, it was a huge thing obviously for Abraham to just leave it all and follow, follow God. <coughs> Well, where are you going? Well, I'm following the Lord. What's his name? Not really sure. He just kind of appeared to me. Where is he leading you? Don't really know. I'm just supposed to follow him. What do you take with you? Nothing. You know, I mean, yeah, this was, would have been a huge thing for him to do. But what God does tell, tell him, and as we'll see in verses 2 and 3, he gives him a series of promises that he can hang on to. And a lot of times it's the same way in our own lives. What are you going to do now? You lost your job. I don't know. I'm just going to try to hang on to the promises of God. What are you going to do next? I don't really know. I'm just going to trust the Lord. But you know God's promises. See, it's, it's, it's not, we don't always know either. Uh, and like Abraham, but God does give us promises to, uh, to hold on to. He promises that he'll take us to be with him one day. He promises to give us forgiveness unconditionally and inner peace. He does promise that we'll uh, he'll be with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He promises that anything he does will be for our ultimate good, but it doesn't mean that it'll always be easy. The call to leave was also to leave the past behind. Leave your father's house. Leave all that's familiar to you. Uh, and certainly leave the corruption of this place behind you and separate yourself from the sinfulness that's here if you're really going to truly come and follow me. But Again, it wasn't easy. Speaking of Japan, I, the first time I went to Japan, I think, I think was 91. And um, we were, I was teaching one weekend in a, in a Calvary Chapel that was um, <clears throat> there in, in Tokyo, the church that is now Calvary Chapel, West Tokyo. And um, the pastor there, Mike Kohama, he had invited some other uh, guys that were passing through to have lunch with us. One was the missions pastor from, from uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, Bob Haig, who now uh, lives here here in the islands. So that's where I met Bob was in Tokyo all, all those years ago. You, do you know Bob or just John? You know John Haig, right? Yeah. You, do you know Bob too? Yeah. So, uh, so I meet Bob uh, all those years ago. He's living here in the islands now. But with him, they were on their way back from Vietnam uh, where they were then smuggling Bibles. I was on my way there to China to smuggle Bibles. And we got together uh, for lunch. And, uh, and he had with him Brother Johan, who now is uh, the president of Open Doors Ministry. And I don't know if you've may or read the, the book, God Smuggler, but uh, Brother Johan, along with Brother Andrew, way back in the day would smuggle Bibles into places like Iran and Iraq in the form of USSR, where they would sew the Bibles into the lining of their coats and go across the border and 
places where if they caught you, they're just going to kind of lock you up, throw the key away kind, kinds of things. And uh, so I, I knew who he was, a tremendous man of God. And, and, uh, and we were having lunch, and I, I was uh, able to ask him, uh, Brother Johan, when, when did you first really get a call from God to be uh, in the ministry and in missions in particular? And he says, oh, it was in 1968. I said, and uh, where did God call you initially? Uh, and he said, uh, Vietnam. And um, since I lived in that era, I, I knew that there was a little war going on in Southeast Asia right at that time. And I said, wow, that must have been hard. He goes, oh, it was very difficult, very difficult. Uh, he says, and then I, uh, I struggled, you know, with the call uh, for uh, a number of weeks, just praying it over and over again, you know, to, to go and move to a country where there's a war being fought. And <laughs> this is my first time out, you know, to serve, serve the Lord. And he said, I certainly question the Lord over and over on that. He says, but I finally went to an older woman in our church and uh, who had served the Lord uh, many years, a real saint, and had gone through some very difficult times in, in following the Lord. And I went to her and I explained my situation. And she said to me, Brother Johan, the safest place for you to be is in Vietnam, if that's where God is calling you. In fact, it probably would be dangerous for you to remain here in Holland. You always want to be in the center of God's will because that's where the blessing of God's will is. If I were you, I would leave immediately. And that was Corey Timbo, who knew something about the difficulty of following God, having, uh, again, her and her family helping Jews, trying to escape uh, the Holocaust, having been captured themselves. She lost all of her family uh, in the concentration camp. She survived and went on and had a, a tremendous ministry. And if you haven't read her, her biography, it's a, it's a great read, even to the point uh, of one night speaking at a, at a church uh, in Germany and having a man come up afterwards who admitted to being one of the prison guards in the camp that she was at where her sister died uh, and asked for forgiveness. Of course, she describes the, the difficulty because of the rage she was feeling inside when she recognized him in the crowd but by the time she was done, God had given her enough grace to forgive. She knew what she was talking about. It's not always easy to follow the call of God. But again, the place of blessing will always be in the center of God's will. Consider the, the, uh, the meaning of the names of the city uh, that Abraham is le uh, leaving. Very interesting. Ur means flame or flames and Chaldean means destruction. You know, God is saying, leave everything behind and all that's familiar to you. But at the same time, he's saying, leave everything that's behind that's bound for destruction in flames anyway and follow me to something uh, that will last for all eternity. In terms of why he called him again, it was simply by grace, but three things to point out. One is his love. God was concerned about the salvation of Abraham uh, and Sarah. So he reveals his glory. He shares the promises Two, his desire to bless the whole world. As we'll get into the covenant, of course, it's going to be through Abraham. The Messiah would come to be a blessing to the whole world. And also because of the fact that Abraham, as I mentioned, would become this tremendous example of walking by faith. It's in chapter 15, verse 6, where we get uh, the occurrence of the word believed for the first time in Scripture, where it says, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham believes God's word. He follows it uh, and is obedient to him because that faith and obedience are always linked together. And God looks down and says, that's righteousness. Paul, again, writing uh, to uh, his epistle to the Romans, trying to explain our faith that we're saved by grace. How do we become righteous in God's sight? Is it by keeping the law? Is it by making any sacrifices? No, because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. When we place our faith in it, God imputes or counts to us, like Abraham, this idea of righteousness. It says the same thing in Galatians 3, 6. And again, James quotes it in James 2:23. One writer said, this is the first time the word believed appears in the scripture. In its context, it means that Abram grounded himself in the integrity of God. Abram walked in obedience with the Lord. He believed the promises of God and trusted in the Lord's faithfulness and not on his own. A number of years ago, 
uh, <laughs> a couple of decades, uh, back when the Promise Keepers uh, events uh, were around. And, and, uh, and what those were were really large stadium events around the country that were men's events. And what they were is really great booking agents because the one uh, that I was able to go to with my uh, dad and brother and brother-in-law was it. At that time, it was uh, Anaheim Stadium. I think it's um, Angel Stadium or whatever now. So uh, kind of cool to be with 50,000 guys uh, on a weekend worshiping the Lord. And uh, Pastor Chuck was there, Chuck Swindoll, Evie Hill, just a bunch of great, uh, great, uh, great speakers uh, and everything. But uh, uh, really an encouraging time in the Lord. Uh, at the end, though, of those Promise Keeper events, they would kind of put up on the big, uh, the big uh, screen out in center field all the promises of a Promise Keeper. And they all sounded great. You know, it was all about promising to be a better father and a better husband walking with the Lord and serving the Lord. I mean, they were all really great. But I, I walked away from that uh, uh, event uh, clear in my mind that I was so thankful that my relationship with the Lord and God's work in my life was not dependent upon any promises that I could make to Him. Because I grew up in a church where everybody was making a lot of promises all the time. Uh, but you know what? We blow it. We blow it. And what Abraham teaches us, what we need to learn to hang on to, is not promises we make to God, but the promises that God makes to us. Uh, so, so important. Because his promises, he will, he will never break his promises. And uh, so important to see that. One person said that the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. Uh, and that's what we're going to see in the life of Abraham. God gives us those opportunities he asks us to walk with him, follow the call, and hang on to the promises. But, uh, the second thing is in verse 2 to 3, the covenant, very important. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So very important, the Abrahamic covenant. It's going to get reiterated a couple of times as we go through. We'll talk uh, more about it. It becomes very critical to our understanding of our own relationship with the Lord, the relationship of the church with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, uh, and of course affects how we view end times or eschatology, as well as how we look at prophecy in the Bible. It becomes critically important because about 80% of the, of the church People that call themselves Christians today in the world do not believe in the Abrahamic covenant. And they've assumed this position that whatever promises made to Abraham and his physical descendants are now belonging to the church and no longer to them, that God's forsaken Israel and so forth. And we call this covenant theology. You, you, you know how you remember that for the test? They don't believe in the covenant. <laughs> I don't know why they call it covenant theology. That's called covenant theology. It's also called replacement theology because they're going to replace Israel with the church and just kind of plug us into these Old Testament passages that dealt specifically with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. So we'll have a lot more to say about it as we go along. It becomes critical to our understanding of issues of our own salvation as well as uh, uh, end times events. But again, God makes a covenant, and just to give you a little biblical uh, definition, I think is important. Sometimes I'll read a definition like this at a wedding ceremony, because at a wedding ceremony, a man and a woman are entering into the contract. No, they're entering into the covenant of, of marriage. Uh, one biblical definition, a covenant in the biblical sense implies much more than a contract or simple agreement. A contract always has an end date, while a covenant is a permanent arrangement. Another difference is that a contract generally involves only one part of a person, such as a skill, while a covenant covers a person's total being. So when that, that, um, that man and that woman are standing there, and I say at some point in time after I've uh, uh, tried my best to wax eloquent for a while, but not too long, uh, I, uh, I will say, are you ready to enter the covenant of, uh, of marriage? And then we begin to go through the vows. Are you ready to commit your total being, one person to the other person, in a permanent uh, relationship with each other, is what we're saying. And, uh, and God here says to Abram, this guy that's uh, 
out doing the idol worship being the, the day before, I'm ready to commit my total being to who you are and have a relationship with you. I'm going to give you all of these promises for your future that we'll see are personal as well as global. Will you come and follow me? See, it's a lot of what Jesus says to us is, uh, as well. So important to see that it's not a contract, it's a covenant. Notice it's all about the Lord. I will make of thee, I will bless thee, I will bless them that bless thee, and so forth. As I said, uh, there, it's personal as well as global. Verse 2, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Those are all very personal things. God promises that Abram would become not just a family. You know, and again, Moses has already told us in the previous chapter, oh, by the way, Sarah is barren. Eh, no children and nothing on the radar here. But through you, that's all going to be different. You're going to have to learn to believe beyond the circumstances of your life right now, Abraham. I'm not going to give you a family. I'm going to make you in a nation. Uh, secondly, he promises to make Abram's name great. And we've already talked about the irony of the fact that they uh, and those with them were leaving that religion of Babel or Babel or Babylon behind leaving the Tower of Babel and Nimrod, who was trying to build a tower and make his, he says, I'll make my name great. And God says to Abraham, if you'll leave that behind, actually, I'll make your name great. Now we're going to see a great response to how Abraham kind of practically deals with that whole idea at the end of the passage. But personal blessings, but there's also global. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not to go into it right now, but we'll, we will later as we see literally God come forth and literally cuts the covenant with Abraham, reiterating all these promises once again and restates the fact that it is unconditional. It's not conditional upon uh, what Abraham does. In the Mosaic covenant, God says through Moses, if you do this and obey me in the land... If you obey this covenant, then I'll bless you in the land. It's conditional. This, this is not conditional. This is just what, a, what God is going to do for Abraham. It's unconditional and it's, uh, and it's permanent. And that's why we still see it in effect and we see its consequences today. So he's going to bless those that bless Abraham and his physical descendants. He's going to curse those or really give disdain to those who disdain Abraham. And in that second part... Uh, in the original language, it, uh, uh, we don't get the full picture. It's almost like God is saying, if someone slaps you in the face, I'm going to punch their lights out. See, it, it's, it's not proportional. Uh, God says, if somebody brings you some harm to you and your physical descendants, there's going to be a heavy judgment that, that falls upon them as a result. Uh, and certainly we see that in Abraham's day. He saw that we're going to meet a guy named Melchizedek. We're going to meet somebody else named Abimelech, and they get blessed simply because they honored Abraham. We're going to meet a woman named Hagar, uh, who basically is, uh, he treats Sarai or Sarah terribly and has great disdain and plots against her. And we're going to see God cut her off uh, in judgment against her. We're going to meet the Canaanite people in this text. And, uh, uh, and when we do, we're going to see that they're the enemies of God. And as a result, and you guys know any, any Canaanites, anybody live in your neighborhood, they happen to be, they're not around anymore, right? They become the ancient Carthaginians. They get destroyed by the Romans. It's still true. Anybody that blesses Abraham's physical descendants will be blessed. Those that curse will be cursed as well. Now, the Apostle Paul explains this, this whole uh, situation in Galatians 3, 8, and 9, this promises to Abraham, very interesting as he applies it to us. He says, in the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. God tells Abraham, through you, I'm going to send the Messiah. He's going to be a blessing to all the nations. That's the word goim. Remember, if you put the I-M, it means plural. So goy is a, a Gentile. Goim are the Gentiles, the nations, everybody else. It's not just a promise 
to the, there's a promise to the Jewish people, but this goes globally to everyone in the world because everyone can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved through the Messiah. So the covenant's personal, it's also global. It's based on three things. It's based on God's faithfulness to forgive. Uh, and again, we're, we're under the new covenant with God. Uh, and certainly we can be thankful in the character and the nature of God. He's faithful to forgive us as well. What if Abraham turns out to be a liar? Oh, he, actually he does. What if his son turns out to be a liar? Well, actually he does as well. What if his grandson turns out to be a crook and a liar? Well, actually he does. Well, what if his descendant through whom the Messiah is going to come, David, turns out to be a murderer and an adulterer? Well, he, well, he does as well. But God, God is going to remain faithful to, to his word. When God says that he will forgive our sins and remember them no more, God will forgive our sins and remember them. What if you turn out to be a liar? What if you turn out to be a murderer? What if you turn out to be an adulterer? God will remember your sins no more. This covenant is based upon God's ability to forgive. And, uh, and we need to remember that. Sometimes we, we get so caught up in, uh, in things that are going on in our own lives. And we begin to question God's character and his ability to forgive. And, and of course, it's because if we were God, we wouldn't. <laughs> but, but he's holy. He's not like us. That's what it means. He's completely different. Uh, it's all bit predicated on his ability to forgive. And what should that do to us? Well, I think it's what it does to Abraham. It causes Abraham to love God more. In the same way that I'm not always the best husband. Sometimes, just a little bit once in a while, I need my wife to forgive me for something I've done or said. And when she does very graciously, it causes me to love her more. Jesus says, he who is forgiven much, loves much. He who is forgiven little, loves little. You know, as we go on in our relationship with the Lord, and kind of the older we get, the more the, the Lord just keeps forgiving us. And, uh, and that, that's not to me a, a discouragement. It's actually supposed to cause us to love God more. And it does when we, when we truly believe what God says in his word. When we're really hanging on to his promises and his character and his nature, it should cause us to see him in a different light uh, and to love him more. Secondly, it's based on God's faithfulness to his word. I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who, her, who curse you. So again, nations have risen and fallen based on how they uh, treat the Jewish people. And there have been a lot of books uh, uh, written upon uh, this. A very, a very interesting study, some of the things that have gone on uh, in the world. But again, the Greeks were, uh, were mighty uh, as an empire uh, until they took over and desecrated the, the Jewish temple there in, Jer in Jerusalem under Antiochus Epiphany, uh, and pretty soon the Greeks were no more. <clears throat> the Romans were a mighty empire at one point in time until they destroyed the Jewish temple in 70 AD, and uh, yeah, there was a point in time when the Roman Empire was no more. Spain was a great empire at one point in time until they turned and began to, to persecute uh, the Jews, uh, very interesting. I was talking to uh, to Henry about this uh, when he was uh, when he was here because he's uh, he's working on a on a PhD uh, there uh, in a university in Jerusalem on a lot of this subject, especially being Spanish speaking. He's got a, a rabbi on his his PhD um, committee uh, who is from Spain and everything. And one of the uh, so I had I had to ask him this. Uh, so, have you found more significant evidence to attest the fact that Christopher Columbus was Jewish? Of course, you guys learned all that in school. <clears throat> but, uh, and he said, yeah, very interesting. Uh, and I've got to email him, get the, the right word for it. There was a group of Jews living in Spain during that time, what we call the Spanish Inquisition, uh, which again is, is, is launched in the year or the year just prior to to uh, Christopher Columbus deciding it would be a really good time to get out of town uh, and, uh, and head west for religious uh, freedom and so forth. Uh, this group of Jews actually had, at least on the surface, renounced Judaism and adopted Christi a formal Christianity of the Roman church so that they could continue to conduct business and prosper and so forth. But everybody kind of knew, and they actually had a certain name for them. Uh, and those are the guys that the, under the Spanish Inquisition uh, that the uh, king and queen of Spain began to kill first. 
And Christopher Columbus, when he sails, the Inquisition was in 1491. When did he sail? 1492. I don't remember a lot from uh, that, those, those days of, uh, of, uh, of world history, uh, but uh, I think there was a song with that or something that kind of stuck. <clears throat> His boat is full of that particular type of Jews that were about ready to be killed. But uh, again, persecution of the Jews by Spain and uh, they're not much of a world empire uh, anymore. I think they have very good soccer teams though, but uh, not much in terms of uh, being a major player in the world. We could go on, Napoleon, Germany, uh, the sun uh, you know, was said the sun never set on the British empire at one point in time until they turned their back upon the Jewish people. And then you have the United States, which is the greatest nation on the planet. And one of the reasons is because we've been a great friend and supporter of the nation Israel. Pray that that continues. The third thing about the covenant, it's based on God's desire, God's desire to bless the whole world. All the nations of the world would be blessed through Jesus Christ. So there's the call of Abraham that there's a lot that we could identify with. It's important. The covenant of Abraham that we'll continue to kind of... Uh, uh, you know, go through the details of as we see it reiterated uh, in the journeys of Abraham. We mentioned the compromise of Abraham last week. And just to, uh, again, very quickly, God tells him to leave his family, leave Ur the Chaldeans and go to the land I'll show you. Uh, and we know that he was uh, one out of three because he did leave behind security, comfort, his place, the big flat screen TV, everything he left behind to now no longer, no longer live in an apartment or condominium or a nice home, but live in a tent. Whatever he was doing before, he would become a, a shepherd, which I th may not have been a real thriving, top on the list vocation for him. But he's willing to do these things in order to follow God. But at the same time, he takes his family with him. Lot who creates problems for him until they eventually separate. And of course, his father, Tera or Tira, who comes with him, which some speculate he must have become a believer uh, and believed in the promises of God as well, or he would have never left uh, this city that he had uh, grown up in and been part of per, for possibly generations. We don't really know, but either way, Abraham doesn't really leave totally his family behind, and he doesn't go all the way to Canaan. We find him ending up in Haran, another center uh, for pagan worship and for the moon god in particular. So there's still compromises in Abraham's life. We're going to see him fall into temptations. He doesn't live a perfect life by any means, he nor his wife. But there's still, uh, there's, there's still part of me that kind of appreciates that, uh, that fact because we get to see how God graciously deals with them and never gives up on them. The fourth thing is we continue the journey, verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was uh, 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Terebeth tree of Moreh. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going still towards the south. Abram continues the journey. Notice it's with others. Verse 4, uh, Abram, uh, so Abram departed because the Lord spoke to him there in Haran. He's there for a period of, uh, again, uh, quite a bit of time. He says, we've got to continue on this 800-mile uh, journey. Uh, so get it in gear. So they leave Haran. But uh, verse 5 is interesting. Uh, then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions they had gathered. And notice, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. So how do you acquire people? Now, some, there's actually some commentaries that would say that he must have had slaves. Uh, but that's not what you find in rabbinical teaching or their writings at all. They say the phrase should be, could be translated, the souls that they had won in Haran. So what he's really doing is he's sharing 
the God of heaven who created everything, the God of Adam, the God of Noah, the God of Shem, the God of Eber, uh, these, these aren't names unfamiliar to these people. That God has called me to go to a land that he's going to show me, and he's made certain promises to me. And if you become part of this, you can worship God, know the blessings of God, and so forth. And so people go with him. So he's gathering. I just find that kind of cool, you know, that he's gathering people around him. He's not there yet, but he's still taking people on, uh, on the way. You know, it's not like we could go visit heaven and come back and go, okay, you, you got to really do this Christian thing because I got to go to heaven. I got to see it. It's very, very, let me just describe some of this. The people that write those books probably never saw that, by the way. But, uh, you know, you know we, don't, we don't get to do that, right? We're, we're still saying we're going there, and we can tell you what the Bible says about it, uh, but it's all about knowing and having a relationship with the one, uh, the one true God. Abraham, in his whole journey, never gets to see it, right? I mean, he gets in Canaan. Canaan isn't the promised land, as we'll see. Heaven is the promised land. He didn't get to see the Messiah. He has the promise of the Messiah. He died awaiting it. But it, but it never slowed him up. It never bothered him. He died awaiting the promise, and he lived on uh, until Jesus the Messiah came and died for his sins. In fact, we see him referenced in the New Testament as a place called Abraham's bosom, where everybody is waiting that died in faith, waiting for the Messiah to come. He died awaiting for the promise, but he's gathering the souls that they had won in Haran. Notice also as they continue, the journey would be mar marked by altars and tents. We mentioned this last week. He builds an altar. He pitches his tent. The tent marked him as a stranger uh, and, as, uh, and as a pilgrim. I mean, when you, drive, when you drive by the beach park today and you, you see a lot of people in tents, are you thinking that, I, think, I guess they're, they're going like, to be there for several generations? No, no, you actually recognize pretty readily that that's, that's a very temporary arrangement, right? And um, some of you gals that don't like to go camping, um, it's not temporary enough. I don't, I don't know. I was just think of the camping trips. Uh, we did a bunch of uh, when the kids were were younger, and it, it got to the point where Josh and I would have to go ahead and set the whole thing up. You know, the canopies, the tents, the kitchen, the you know, the whole thing, washer, dryer. You know, <laughs> everything had to be there before you know Kathy and Melissa would finally come down and and join us. Sometimes later that night after dinner was ready. But it's like. You can tell we really love to camp. You know, we're willing to do all this. But uh, they're always quite happy to be heading home the other, the other way. I mean, I don't understand it. We had running water. There was actually even toilets. It really wasn't even like camping. I mean, it was, you know, we were just had everything. But uh, uh, a tent is an indication that you're a stranger, that you're a pilgrim. An altar marked him as a citizen of heaven who worshiped the true and living God versus the temples and the ziggurats and... Uh, the, uh, the idols that were being worshipped by others. Abraham's uh, continued his journey to be marked not just by altars and tents, but by a clear vision and authentic faith uh, demands that we see ourselves as just pilgrims passing through. The letter of Hebrews 11.9 says, By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham becomes a pretty wealthy guy, by the way, by the time we see him move along. Why? Because God just keeps blessing him, multiplying his herds. He kind of gets into this shepherd gig and uh, figures it all out. And, but, you know, God's the one that's really uh, blessing and everything. But it, it never really means anything to him. I, I've met very few wealthy guys that, uh, that had a light touch on, on this world. Uh, Paul tells us that uh, it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not the money, it's the love of it, you know, and that's what you, you, you live, of, live for. I like the proverb that says, <laughs> riches can grow wings and fly away. <laughs> Uh, some of them might do that here in a couple of days, by the way, if Congress doesn't get it together. <laughs> but uh, it's just going to fly away here again for a little bit. But all reminders uh, to uh, keep a light touch on the, uh, on the things uh, of this world. Uh, it's a radical concept. Ken Hughes says this uh, about it in, uh, in Abraham's view uh, of materials things. 
He says uh, that idea is a radical because it challenges the dominant ideologies of our time which yearn for settlement, security, and placement. Everything around us tells us to hunker down, save everything, hedge ourselves about with every protection. Our natural desires are for more comforts. Our culture celebrates great homes and dynastic families. And uh, there's nothing wrong with having a nice home and, uh, and those kinds of things. But, uh, uh, yeah, but when the things have you, rather than you having the things, uh, you know, when you love the possessions more than people, you know, that's when we're, uh, we're in a lot of trouble. Paul gives us this advice about our attitudes in Colossians 3.1. If then you were raised with Christ, which we are, that's an if and it's so, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Paul says this uh, in Philippians, that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will one day transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be like his glorious bodies. And that's what we're supposed to be living for, but it's so, uh, everything in this world is driving us towards something very, very different from that. But so much that we can learn. Abraham had a, a real clear vision uh, along the way. Notice also his life would be marked by a clear promise. Verse seven, the promise of the land, the first mention. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land, the promise of the land. Now, very interesting, the context of verse 6. Notice that Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem. And as far as the oak or the Tarmath tree, the tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were in the land. This is like Lord of the Rings kind of stuff, the tree of Morah. What that was was a place where they gathered the Canaanites, who were the enemies of God's people, all the way through the scriptures, uh, and very pagan, having adopted, again, that religion from ancient Babylon, the Tower of Babylon, the worship of Baal and Molech, sacrificing their children in the fire and uh, the fires and so forth. And this was a place where when the oak tree and the wind would blow, the soothsayers or their false prophets would listen and pretty much probably being channeling demons would listen to the rustling in the leaves and then speak what their demagogues were, were saying to them. So it was, a very, it was a very spiritual place to them. For the believer, Abraham, it was a very spiritual place as, as well, dark spiritually and very demonic. And God says to him in that place, uh, Abraham, actually, this is the place. I know we've been traveling like 800 miles and everything, seen a lot of beautiful country uh, along the way. We've been some, through some huge urban centers, uh, centers. We went through Damascus. We went through uh, all these other, other uh, cities and everything. But uh, did I mention this is the land I'm giving you? How about if we keep going further down the road here just a little bit? I'm pretty sure these guys all want to kill me here. Uh, it, it's just, no, you guys don't find that ironic that it's in this setting that God reiterates, this is the land. This is where we've been going. This is what I'm going to give you. And, uh, and certainly he's got to hang on to those promises and keep his eyes off the circumstances. But I also find it neat that even in the midst of adversity and spiritual adversity, that God is there saying, I got promises. Look to me, Abraham. Don't look to what's going on, on around you. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are deceived, but you've already won souls and there's more to be, to be won. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I'll give this land. Notice also, in part of the, uh, this journey is he calls on the name of the Lord. He pitched his tent in Bethel on the west and I on the east. And again, he's between the two. Uh, not to make too much, again, of names, but we all know that Bethel is the house of God. You may not know that I means the ruin or destruction. And Moses is, again, is very carefully. We've, sh we've showed this, that he's always got them moving from east to west. In other words, to the light. Uh, and it's no coincidence. He's got them leaving a place of destruction and going to, to the house of God. And Shechem, uh, again, like the, uh, the, uh, uh, the tree there uh, where they worshipped that God, this also was the head sanctuary of, 
uh, the pantheon of the Canaanite gods there in Shechem. So uh, once again, uh, it's a place where there was probably demonic activity as, as believers as we would understand it. Uh, and again, Luther, when he talks about the fact that it's in this place that he proclaims the name of the Lord, Luther actually translated, he preached the name of the Lord. Again, get the correct image. Abraham's probably got a couple hundred guys with him. It's not like, hey, okay, this is kind of like kind of weird here, and you know, and they've got a little demonic activity, so we're gonna, you know, get a guitar out and sing Kumbaya, a couple of verses here, so we can kind of sleep good tonight. That's not what's going on. Abraham's probably got a couple hundred people with him. Uh, he travels now with an entourage of, of people that as the Lord is, is blessing him. Uh, and he says, uh, we're gonna have a worship service tonight. And the altar they built were uncut stones stacked up. I doubt if it was one like we would build in two or three minutes. I, I bet it was pretty sizable because these things seem to remain for years as monuments to his own faith in, in the living God. And then when it says they proclaim the name of God, again, Luther says he was preaching. It means he's talking about or proclaiming the nature of God and God's righteousness and God's promises and all the things that he knows about God, he's proclaiming there. There might have been a little shouting going on around that campfire that night. Now, again, what I find interesting about this <clears throat> is God says to him, I'll make your name great. And Abraham says, no, you won't. I'll make your name great. I love that. I love that. That's kind of a creepy thought to think that someone would make your name great. I'll make your name great. Not sure I really want that. <laughs> I mean, you might, you know, at 19 or something, I don't know, maybe that sounds good or whatever, but, you know, there's a point where I'm not sure I really want that. Abraham has the maturity to say, I'm not really sure what's up with all that, Lord, but I do know what, what's in my heart. And that is, I want to make your name great to other people. I want to proclaim people how great you are and your nature and your character. And it doesn't even matter if the guys down the street or having this whole pagan thing going on and worshiping the devil down there, I'm still going to proclaim your greatness right here where I'm at. And I'm going to win as many souls to you uh, as, I, as I possibly can. How's Abraham doing so far? He's doing pretty good, isn't he? Uh, don't read ahead then. You're going to get your bubble burst. <laughs> but he, he's, he's, he's like us. I mean, he kind of hits these pinnacles where, man, he's in the center of God's will. He's telling people about the Lord. Uh, and he's seeing God's blessing and things are happening. And, you know, and then he hits some tough times and goes, okay, thank you, God. You've been doing really good, but uh, I'm out of here. You know, and then, and then God so graciously goes back and, um, and doesn't say, I thought you promised. He never does that. God always goes back and says, remember what I promised to you. You know, there's just, again, so much that we want to hang on to as we follow the journeys of Abraham. Do we dwell in a tent, realize we're just passing through? Do we leave altars in our life where we've proclaimed the name of the Lord? And do others know that we're a worshiper of the one true God? I, I heard a great little <coughs> story between the services. Uh, just uh, one of the young, young guys, he's in, he's in elementary school. Uh, but carries a Bible with in the public school every day. I thought that was pretty cool. I thought it took a lot of guts uh, in this day and age. And, and, they, and he doesn't do it like to send a message. He just does it because he wants to read it. And he, he knows he's going to have some time. It's not like I'm going to show these guys. It's just, this is just what I do. You know, the kid's like eight or nine years old. I was, I was really, really uh, blown away by that. Uh, that's an Abraham kind of thing, isn't it? something we can all learn from.